If you're moving to DC, I'm gonna give you some information to help you get settled once you're here. My name is Rob. I'm a tour guide and the founder of Trip Hacks DC Tours. On this channel, I share my best tips, tricks, and hacks for exploring Washington, DC. And over at triphacksdc.com, you'll find info about tours and more. This is the final video in a three-part series about moving to Washington, DC in collaboration with the YouTube channel, Coffee with Coleman. John and I sat down and talked for an hour about tips for moving to and living in Washington, D.C. And that's available in podcast format that you can listen to right now. And I highly recommend checking out John's videos over at Coffee with Coleman if you're interested in Washington, D.C., business, real estate, and all that good stuff. In part one of this series, I covered how to choose a neighborhood. In part two, I did a deep dive into the costs of living in DC. And in this third video, I'll cover some miscellaneous topics that people ask me about somewhat frequently. Plus, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on these topics. So after you're done watching, leave a comment and let me know if you learned anything interesting from this video and what it was. With that said, let's get started. One of the age old debates when you move to Washington DC is the car versus no car question. When you visit Washington DC, most likely you don't get a rental car at the airport. You get around by walking, metro, and maybe a cab or Uber. But if you own a car back home, you have to make a decision. Do you sell it, give it away, or bring it with you? Ultimately, this is a personal decision and depends on far too many factors than I could cover in this video. Basically, when it comes to this topic, the way I think of it is that there are three groups in DC. People who need a car and have a car. People who don't need a car and don't have a car. And people who don't really need a car, but have one anyway. The first two groups are pretty straightforward. The third is a little tricky. So I would suggest asking yourself this question. If you don't really need a car, why do you wanna have one? Is it because you've always had one and can't imagine life any other way? Is it because you take occasional trips once or twice a year and want it for that? Is it because you're a car buff and just love cars or something else entirely? I personally am in the group of don't need a car and don't have a car. And some people misinterpret this to think I don't have a driver's license and never drive, which is not accurate. When I do drive, it's a rental car maybe a few times a year. So there might be more options out there than you think. And I'd advise thinking this all the way through before you make a decision. Next, let's talk taxes. I know nobody likes taxes, but it's important because as Benjamin Franklin said, in this world, nothing is certain except death and taxes. If you live in Washington, DC, there are three primary types of taxes that you should know about. Income tax, property tax, and sales tax. There are other taxes like business tax or other niche taxes, but I'm not gonna cover them in this video because most people won't have to worry about them. But if you do need to worry about them, you should probably hire an accountant to help you figure it out. Now, having met many people from many different parts of the country over the years, my impression is that some of our taxes are higher than other places, some are lower than other places, and in the end, it kind of averages out to the point where taxes in Washington DC for the average person are probably similar to most other big cities. Let's start with income tax. We have a progressive income tax, which is very similar to how the federal income tax works. You add up your income, subtract your deductions, and then pay a certain percentage on each bracket of your income. Then there's property tax. If you own a home or any real estate, you pay a tax based on the assessed value of that property, minus any deductions like the homestead deduction. If you're a renter, you don't directly pay any property tax, though arguably you do indirectly pay it through your rent. Importantly, DC is considered a state for tax purposes, which means there's no additional county tax or city tax or anything like that, which depending on where you live, might stack up on top of your federal tax and state tax. And lastly, there's sales tax. This is a tax on the stuff you buy. In DC, different items are taxed at different rates. For example, groceries are not taxed at all. 
and alcohol is taxed at 10.25%. I previously made a video about taxes that visitors should know about, and that is heavily about sales tax. So check out the video description so you can watch that. Next, let's talk about politics. And before I get myself into trouble here, no, I'm not talking about this, or this, or this. I'm talking about the city council, the mayor, and city departments. This is definitely not what your average visitor thinks of when they hear Washington DC politics, but it's important. Arguably, local politics is far more important to your day-to-day -day life if you're living here in DC than what's happening on Capitol Hill. If you're moving to DC, you should familiarize yourself with the basics of local government. The city is split into eight wards, with each ward having a council member representing the people who live there. There are also four at-large council members who represent people from the entire city, and a council chairperson who is also elected at-large. We have a unicameral legislature, which means that any legislation they pass immediately goes to the mayor for signature or veto. And with enough votes, the council can also override a veto. Another important piece of local politics are called advisory neighborhood commissions. These are neighborhood bodies led by elected commissioners. If you care about stuff happening in your neighborhood, you can get involved in these. Even if you don't want to get deeply involved, just knowing your elected commissioner is worthwhile in case you ever have any trouble or need something in your neighborhood. Okay, now another question from new arrivers is, what is the best internet service provider? The good news is that you can get a solid internet connection in DC. The not so good news is that there are not a lot of choices and some of the providers have notoriously bad reputations. Right now, in 2022, your choices basically are Comcast Xfinity, Verizon Fios, RCN, and Starry, which is relatively new. The trick is that not every house or apartment will be served by all four of these. Some places might only have two to choose from. And if you get really unlucky, the place you choose to live might only have one choice. A quick note, do not get Verizon DSL if it is offered to you. I don't even know why they still sell this. It's 25 year old technology that is not sufficient these days. Like I said in part two of this video, I have gigabit service from Verizon Fios. So you can go back and watch part two of this series if you wanna know how much I pay for it. In general, it is a very solid connection, but every time I need to contact Verizon for support, renegotiating the bill, or anything else, it is truly painful. And lastly, let's run through what you can do for fun when you move to DC. In part two of this series, I said that you can keep yourself entertained for very little money if you wanted to. And a big part of this is that you can go to places like Smithsonian museums and other big special events. There's no rule that says that stuff is only for tourists. And in fact, it's even better when you live here because you can go whenever you please. I personally am a fan of pro sports. And if you're a sports fan, there are tons of options. We have a team in all of the big five sports leagues. That's the NFL, MLB, NBA, NHL, and MLS. We also have a recent world champion WNBA team, the Washington Mystics, and a recent NWSL championship team, the Washington Spirit. We have a professional ultimate disc league team, the DC Breeze, and you can watch professional tennis here too, like the City Open in the summer. If you're into college sports, Georgetown has had a very good men's basketball team over the years, and the University of Maryland has historically fielded pretty good women's basketball teams. If you're into theater or performing arts, you can't go wrong at the Kennedy Center, which has everything from musicals to opera to symphony and a whole lot else. And if you like concerts, Washington DC has a surprisingly good live music scene. So good, in fact, that I recorded an entire podcast episode about it. 
So check out the description if you want to find a link to that. And if your idea of fun is just hanging out with friends, there are lots of options for that too. Washington DC has a pretty active happy hour scene. If you went to college, many alumni associations have a big presence here in DC. Or if you want to make new friends, there are social sports leagues that you can sign up for and get involved with. Basically, if there's something that you're interested in, chances are you will find other people here who are interested in that too. And hey, if you made it this far, then I highly recommend watching the other two videos in this series if you haven't already. And if you have, then may I suggest another Trip Hacks DC video? You can go ahead and click or tap right over here to watch another one. And whether you live in DC or are visiting, if you're interested in signing up for a Trip Hacks DC guided tour, you can click or tap on the Capitol Dome on the left side of my head that'll send you right over to tripxdc.com where you can see all of the tours that we offer. Enjoy your trip.